Uh, today we have uh, Abhinav Vallado uh, doing a talk. Uh, Abhinav is an assistant professor and uh, the director of robotics uh, robot learning lab sorry, at the University of Freiburg in Germany. Um, he's also a member of the Department of Computer Science uh, and the Brain Links Brain Tool Center and a founding faculty um, member of the Ellis unit in Freiburg. He is a DFG Emmy Nother AI Fellow um, and co-chair of the IEEE Robotics and Automation Society Te Technical Committee on Robot, Robot Learning. Uh, he received his PhD with a distinction at the University of Freiburg and his uh, master's uh, in robotics from the Robotics Institute in, from CMU. He co-founded and served as the director of operations of Platypus, a company developing uh, robotic boats and has previously worked at the National Robotics Engineering Center and the Field Robotics Center of CMU. His current research lies at the intersection of robotics, machine learning, and computer vision, with a focus on tackling fundamental robot perception, state estimation, and planning problems, uh, using learning approaches to enable robots to operate in complex and diverse environments. His uh, robot learning group has developed several innovative techniques for scene understanding, state estimation, and navigation that have defined the state of the art and ranked at the top benchmarks. This group has also won several major competitions, and many aspects of their research have been featured in uh, media such as NBC News, Discovery Channel, and Business Times. Okay, I'll give it over to you, Abhinav. Thank you for that uh, kind of introduction. Um, today, so I'm going to be talking about some of our work from the last um, last years, as well as some very new work that I haven't presented before. So let's start with some high level introduction in general about um, perception in the last decade. So we have seen tremendous progress in various perception tasks, as well as some localization and planning tasks. And this has been primarily fueled by modern learning techniques, such as um, deep learning. And the caveat here is that this has also led to some disadvantages, such that um, since supervised learning is what works really well, this has increased our dependency in manually annotated labels or um, if you do reinforcement learning, this is manually designed reward functions as well. And if you look at this plot here, this kind of shows you the various, uh, oops, this kind of shows you um, the various um, state of the art um, language model, speech, vision, and so on, how they, how they are basically scaling um, today from the last couple of years. Um, and we can see that we've seen a very high steep increase. And basically, um, if, we, if we want to do these on our robots, if we want to do these learning on our robots, this would be um, computationally intractable. And robots also operate in um, many seasons, many locations, and so on. And um, typically, our deep learning models that we train are trained on these limited set of data sets, and they do not generalize to these novel scenarios. And of course, we all have um, different types of robots. They have different locomotion abilities. They have different sensors. They look at the world from different point of views. And this is also like a large domain gap that is specific to robotics, which is not there um, in other some of the other fields. So this basically um, motivates my talk today. So how do we learn perception models that scale across different tasks, modalities, environments, sensor configurations, and um, so on. All right, so let's let's start with um, some um, basic perception tasks. So I think most of you might be um, familiar with what semantic segmentation is here. Our goal um, is to label each pixel with um, a semantic class. And here in semantic segmentation, we have no reasoning about um, object instances in the scene. Whereas we have another complementary task, which is called instance segmentation. And in instance segmentation, 
be um, reason about only a few objects that can specifically be counted or, or typically also moving. And um, here we also can differentiate or distinguish between instances of the same object. And now panoptic segmentation is basically a task that combines both, oops, combines both semantic segmentation and instance segmentation and gives us a more holistic understanding of the scene. So um, about last year, we tackled this, um, tackled this problem and proposed our um, efficient PS architecture here. So at a very high level, we basically have a backbone that is showed here in um, these pink blocks. And our backbone is based on our modified um, efficient net architecture. And then we have our um, two-way feature pyramid network, which basically um, aggregates multi-scale features in this um, bi-directional manner. And then we have two task-specific heads, one for learning the semantics shown here in yellow and another for learning the instances. And then we fused the logics from both of these to finally give our panoptic segmentation output. So we uh, benchmarked this on pretty much every data set for semantic segmentation, uh, for panoptic segmentation at that point of time. So ranging from cityscapes, Kitty, Mapillary Vestas, and IDD. And um, we achieved the state of the art, so primarily ranked number one for all of these um, benchmarks. Now that we also do two of these individual tasks together, we can also benchmark these um, on these individual tasks. And um, what was nice here is that even though we do much more than this, we were still ranked number two for this for these individual tasks, which sort of shows you the benefits of multitask learning in this case than specialized models. Uh, and I think for robotics, what is most interesting and what we spent most of our time here is um, not basically doing all the benchmarking tricks that's, that's possible that you typically do. Um, we wanted to still achieve, um, we wanted to be more computationally efficient, efficient than the state of the art models. And we also wanted to have a bit of faster time. So here we spent most of our, most of our um, work keeping this more computationally efficient. We also took part in the ECCV Robust Vision Challenge end of 2020. Um, and what's different in this challenge, if, if you are aware of it, is here, we have to basically train one model on a diverse set of data sets. So these data sets range from various urban environments, but also indoor environments. So in the end, the amount of semantic classes that you have to um, learn about is over a hundred different classes. So this is extremely, um, extremely challenging task. Okay, so let's look at some qualitative results here. So this is on the um, Cityscapes data set. Um, what's interesting to see here is that you can see our network segments thin objects such as poles um, quite well. And this is really challenging for networks in general. We can also distinguish objects of multiple scales such as people that we saw in the previous video. And um, we can, um, our network is able to capture accurate object boundaries and this can be seen in classes such as trees and so on. Um, now this is a very interesting data set in Mapillary Vestas. You can see for some of the uh, background classes such as trees and buildings, there's pretty much um, near perfect segmentation. And um, this really shows you the power of the network. Okay, so up to some um, new work right now. So I'm very briefly going to talk about two extensions of this uh, panoptic segmentation here. So this is some work that we will present um, next week in CVPR. So here we basically introduce a new task that we call as um, amodal panoptic segmentation. So what amodal perception is, is that so basically humans have this remarkable ability. So if you look at an object in front of you, and if you sort of cover an object partially, you can still perceive that this, even though you cover a part of it, um, you can still perceive the entire object as a whole. And this gives us um, tremendous capabilities uh, in the real world in terms of 
um, tracking and so on. So basically we wanted to give robots the same ability. So what does this look like? So um, if you can see here, so we have here act the actual predictions of the network. And um, regardless of occlusion, we predict the entire object mask of objects. So um, that's why you see these overlapping masks um, that's basically visualized in this scene. So we extended the network that I previously presented and we additionally added an, an A-modal segmentation head, which basically predicts the occlusion order of the objects in the scene. And then it tries to predict for each occlusion order, what are the visible and as well as the invisible parts of the scene. And um, to tackle this task, we proposed two data sets or extensions of two data sets uh, for the Kitty and the BDD 100 data set. And um, here are some results on the bottom that you see of our approach. And some extensions of this that we are further working on right now is to show the actual benefits of this. So we show benefits in terms of um, object tracking that you can do better tracking for pose estimation and so on. All right, so another extension of this work as well. So we presented this at ICRA um, two weeks back, basically. So um, we all know that um, bird's eye view maps, which is an example that you see here, has become quite a standard for automated driving for planning, um, trajectory prediction, and so on. So typically the way you generate these maps is that you either have a depth image and you do the projection onto the depth image, or if you have um, LiDAR, you can do this as well. And here we basically wanted to tackle this challenge where given um, monocular color image as input, we wanted to predict these bird's eye view maps um, as well in a, in a panoptic manner. So here we proposed our um, BEV approach here. So it again is an extension of the network that we proposed before. So what is novel here is that we propose a new dense transformer module, which is basically based on the principle of how vertical regions in the image are mapped to the bird's eye view and how flat regions. So we basically um, handle these two cases separately in our transformer approach. And we show that it basically outperforms um, existing methods. So if you if you were in ICRA, actually, you must have noticed the um, the best paper award this year, and that basically does it in the semantic space. And here we already tackled it. We tackle a more complex problem to do this um, for instances as well. And again, some qualitative results. So we also introduced new data sets to um, extensions of data sets on Kitty to tackle this problem and as well as new metrics to do this. So as throughout this talk, uh, maybe I forgot to say this, you will notice websites such as this, and this is where you can find um, the code, the data set, the benchmark and so on. All right, so I think we all know here that um, LIDARs are again a very interesting modality, especially for robots. Um, they give us this really nice geometric description of the environment, um, whereas LIDARs also have a unique set of different challenges. So they're basically unordered and give us this irregular structure of point clouds. And um, LIDARs also have these distance dependent sparsity where further away objects are much sparser in nature. And this also gives us a unique set of challenges to um, deal with, with uh, convolutional networks. So on one hand, you can say that we can employ just 3D convolutions to tackle this, but 3D convolutions are not so optimized as well as 2D convolutions work in, um, in our um, libraries, basically. So, to basically to bridge this gap between um, using 3D information, but still using the well-known 2D convolutions, we proposed a set of um, fundamental learning uh, techniques. So one of them that we call as proximity convolution here. So here, the best way to describe this is that um, we basically change the sampling location of the convolution operation 
uh, based on the range information that we have um, in the range image. So if you do the standard, uh, if you take a three by three convolution and you do the convolution in a, using a standard three by three convolution, you would do a fixed sampling just along the nine points uh, around the sampling grid. And if you use our proximity convolution, we basically change the sampling location based on the range values. And this basically adapts to the range values. And what is the benefits of this? Um, let's see some visualizations. This is the range image. Um, and here, if we look at this location, so this I think is basically a, a very distant pedestrian. And you can see that if you use the standard um, con uh, three by three convolution here, you have this fixed sampling uh, locations for this um, yellow dot. And if we use approximate convolution, you can see that there's more denser sampling on um, objects of interest. And this gives us better um, segmentation capabilities. So we also proposed our um, range guided depthwise separable at risk convolutions. So if you're familiar with at risk convolutions, we basically insert these, um, they're also called dilated convolutions. We basically insert these holes between the sampling locations. And in this um, range guided version, what we do is that we again adapt the um, dilation rates or the actress rates based on the range um, that we have in the image. So we do more denser sampling for distant objects um, because they are small and they are further away. And for objects that are close to Close to the LIDAR here, we do more sparser sampling because we can uh, get more spatial context by doing this. So we uh, employ this again in different stages of our approach. So basically uh, the input to our network is the range image, the intensity and the XYZ um, locations. And then we pass this to our proximity convolution module, which contains these modules that I showed before. And once again, we have our encoder, a two-way um, a two-way feature pyramid network for aggregation, and then a semantic head and an instance head. And then we project this back to the uh, point cloud domain using um, a K nearest neighbor scheme. And we um, evaluated this on the semantic query data set, and we also proposed an extension of new scenes right after this that we call as panoptic new scenes in collaboration with Motional. And um, we basically achieved uh, state-of-the-art performance. We were ranked number one. I think currently we are ranked number two, even after about a year on um, Semantic Kitty. And we achieved um, substantial improvement from previous approaches. Um, so this large improvement is basically unusual to see on um, benchmarks typically. Okay, so again, some results here. So you, we can see that um, this is on semantic kitty, um, quite good segmentation here on different object classes such as cars, sidewalks, and so on. All right, so in, um, in normal semantic segmentation that you can see on the left, if you have no temporal associations, we just do this um, semantic segmentation, instant segmentation or panoptic segmentation in a scan wise manner. So you have, if you have multiple scans as your robot or your vehicle moves around in the environment, um, especially for instances of objects, there's no temporal um, consistency. So if we um, segment one instance of an object at one uh, in one scan, in the next scan, we don't know if that's the same object. So typically the way you tackle this is to just do tracking on a separate thread uh, simultaneously, and then you get these associations. Um, so in, in this subsequent work here, which is shown on the right, we wanted to basically see if there are benefits in learning to do tracking simultaneously while you're doing panoptic segmentation. So, um, so in addition to having a semantic head and instance head, we also have a tracking head in parallel to this. 
And then this also gives us um, the, ability to, the ability to have temporally consistent association of instances. So this is why on the right that you see here, you see that the cars here have the same color, whereas on the left, kind of these mixed colors. Um, this is because at each can be assigned a different instance ID, so a different color. And um, we also propose new metrics, benchmarks, as well as two techniques to um, handle this in our um, CVPR 2020 paper, as well as our RAL paper this year. Okay, so all the results that we saw on, um, on these LIDAR, um, LIDAR data sets that we saw before works really well if you test, uh, if you train and test on these data sets. So now if you train and deploy them in the real world with a different sensor setup, they basically don't really work. So we get this really large domain gap, as you see here. So this is basically trained on Semantic Kitty and evaluated on the new scenes data set. Um, so LIDARs are, have these really large domain gap when they are evaluated on data from different um, LIDARs that have different number of scan lines, they have different intensity patterns, and they, are also, they also differ a lot when you have different mounting locations. So to um, address this, we proposed the first unsupervised domain adaptation approach for LIDAR panoptic segmentation. And here, uh, our um, unsupervised approach basically accounts for the variation in the number of scan lines, the mounting positions, the intensity patterns, as well as the environment um, conditions here. And we combine two strategies together in this one that we call as database uh, domain adaptation, which reduces the variation between the how the two scans look like in terms of um, the point density, scan lines, and so on. And then we also combine them with um, model-based domain adaptation strategy, which then here reduces the disparity in terms of the representations in the uh, representation domain gap between the two um, environments here. And uh, if you look at the results on the bottom here, without any domain adaptation trained on semantic kitty and evaluated on new scenes, New scenes is really sparse, as you can see here. Um, so without a domain adaptation, um, the network fails really terribly in a lot of these uh, semantic classes. And you can see here with our domain adaptation strategy, we get um, quite good results here. And the interesting thing here is that it's completely unsupervised in nature. Okay, so that was a lot of um, perceptions. So I briefly also a little, want to touch a little bit upon um, localization. So what LIDARs are really good at is also to give us um, very accurate positioning in the environment. And um, we also um, tackled this in two different works very recently. So one interesting thing that we noticed is that um, almost all the loop closure detection approaches for SLAM that uses deep learning, um, basically only trained on um, these certain set of sequences on the Kitty data set. And um, this was kind of an established way of having some sequences for training and some sequences for evaluation. And while we were working on this, we noticed that all the sequences for evaluation on this uh, for loop closure detection, basically only evaluated on loops that are in the same direction. Basically, they don't have any reverse loops, which means that you go in one direction and you come back in the other direction. So um, when we tried all the existing approaches, it turns out that all of them pretty much failed uh, miserably. So they work really well when you do when you have the same direction loops. But when you come back in the opposite direction, um, looking at the scene from a different perspective, they, um, yeah, they didn't work really so well. So we, here we proposed an approach to um, also to show that this uh, exists in this evaluation protocol so far and um, a way to tackle this. So here we proposed our, um, on a very high level again, an LCD net architecture that we, as we call it. So it, it consists of, um, a shared feature extractor 
that, uh, that has these um, two streams here. And then we have our um, place recognition head and our relative pose estimation head. So our relative pose estimation head here estimates the complete six DOF transformation to align to point clouds. And, um, and we also integrate this into a complete, a full SLAM system, um, Leo SAM, if you're familiar with this. And we show that we achieve um, state-of-the-art performance for both, um, both types of valuations. If you only consider same direction loops, um, but you even if you consider reverse direction loops. So here's some results on the Kitty data set. Um, we noticed that once we start going around these turns here, we start getting quite a bit of drift. And just in a bit, when we detect, oops, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so just about here, we will start seeing again some drift. And once we get to a loop, our approach detects this as a place that it's seen before, and it will start basically aligning these two point clouds here. Yep. And this, got, and this works quite well in the real world as well. So I think in, in the paper, we also show um, zero shot transfer to um, Freiburg, which basically the network has never seen before. Okay, um, so I, I very briefly again want to talk about this um, very new work um, that is unpublished, was just put on archive a couple of we weeks back. So, um, so SLAM in general is generalizable um, as long as if you don't use any learning components in, into the SLAM pipeline, right? But as soon as you include some learning components, what happens is that again, we have this huge, huge um, domain gap. On, on one hand, you can, uh, there is this very well-known task that we call as lifelong SLAM um, that tackles challenges um, in, with, in relation to domain gap in sort of one environment, but long-term changes that happens in this one environment. And then we have, Another task that we call as domain adaptation, which then handles this um, problem of having these little larger domain gap from environments, similar to what we would see if we go from trained on a city such as Zurich, and then now we go to a completely different country such as Germany, Karlsruhe here. Here, these two cities look very, very different. So domain adaptation basically um, tackles this challenge. Now we want to tackle a new challenge that we call as um, continual slam. So here we basically want to tackle this challenge where you basically imagine your model is trained on Zurich, then you deploy on Karlsruhe, then you go to Oxford, and then you go back to Zurich. Um, go back to Zurich. So this is not basically um, tackled in this domain adaptation uh, task as well as lifelong slam task. So. Here we call this as continual slam, which basically has these bi-directional transfer from n number of environments that you have been before, as well as new environments um, your car or your robot can en encounter in the real world. So um, we also propose a new approach to uh, the first approach to tackle this that we call as CL slam for visual slam here. And uh, CL SLAM approach basically um, targets this problem called catastrophic forgetting when we get into this uh, domain of continuous adaptation. So our um, network basically contains two components here. So again, we have this dual network architecture. We have this um, generalizer here on one hand and the expert. So expert basically produces this um, online odometry estimates um, and our generalizer adapts these for long-term learning by combining, uh, combining the information from the replay buffer. So we basically train the generalizer and the 
expert in a completely self-supervised manner using self-supervised losses for photometric consistency. And um, whereas the weights of the generalizer are basically only updated um, on the combination of previous data from the, replay, from the replay buffer, as well as the online data, and the expert here only uses the online data. So after the network has been trained, we basically um, throw away the uh, weights of the expert and we initialize the weights from the generalizer. Um, another thing here is that to reduce drift, we also detect loops and we add it to the post graph for optimization. And um, we, we also create a 3D dense map using the poses as well as the dense um, depth, which is predicted here in our network. So let's do some um, qualitative comparisons here. So here we show you B fixed, which is in yellow, which is a network that is trained on uh, one data set and evaluated on another data set. So here we specifically take this case in which we're trained on cityscapes, then we deploy on Kitty, then we deploy on robot car, and then we go on Kitty once again. So if we have a fixed network that is only trained on cityscapes, and then evaluated in the sequence, we see that we have these um, enormous drift, uh, the ground truth here is these dashed lines basically. Then we have our export network here, which only does continuous adaptation one after the other. And uh, this basically uh, translates to only using one half of our network that is only the export that only uses online data for adaptation. And then we have B general, which is only using the generalizer network without the expert network here. And you can see that um, the combination of both, which is our CL slam here performs the best and closest to the ground truth um, when we start getting a lot of drift here. We can also build um, quite good 3D maps of the environment using the same approach and just some quick qualitative results on the right. All right, so this last part of this talk, um, just to give some motivation, um, I really like this quote from Pierre here from Google Brain. So what he says is that give a robot a label and you feed it for a second and you teach a robot to label and you feed it for a lifetime. And what this means is that mostly that if we um, just focus on supervised approaches, you kind of tackle these limited set of environments. And if we um, enable a robot to use labels that are freely available in the environment, such as some self-supervision approaches, you can enable it to, to operate um, in a lifetime manner. So um, one of the ways that we wanted to tackle this, um, which is unique to robots, I think in general, is that we have um, a robots equipped with several different modalities. So here we see um, the color image on the left, the depth image in the center and the thermal image on the right. And all of these capture the same environment from a similar point of view. And if you have calibration, you can make this exactly the same. And, um, but they look at the world using these different modalities. And this is sort of unique when it comes to robotics. So here we wanted to see is that um, if we capture these, if you capture the world with these different modalities simultaneously, can we exploit this nature of co-occurrence um, of modalities as a self-supervision signal? Um, and um, we wanted to put this to the most extreme test. So, what we wanted to do is we wanted to do object detection um, using these modalities while training and while deploying, we only wanted to use um, sound as a modality for inference. So um, I don't know if you can hear it, but so this is the sound of the environment that is captured in the scene. So while training, we wanted to use all of these modalities to give supervision, and while deploying, we only want the sounds of the environment um, to detect objects in the camera, camera frame, basically. So what we did is that um, here you see our sensor setup of our car here. 
So we, um, this is a bit old. So we have uh, a Valadine 64 here, some two Valadines that are looking side on the more um, taller buildings. We have two stereo cameras in the front in um, the stereo configuration. We also have two thermal cameras in this um, configuration. And then we have our um, octagon microphone array, um, very expensive. I think they, they cost about five euros each, um, these microphones. So we collected a lot of data, unlabeled data by just driving around in Freiburg. Um, lots of master student hours, about 300 kilometers of driving data in Freiburg. Um, we, correct, we collected various conditions, dawn, dusk, night, and so on, because um, in different, uh, different lighting conditions, different modalities work better. So we wanted to capture these variations in our data set. Um, so if you're interested in a data set, you can visit our website here, multimodal-distal. And you can also find it in our lab's website um, later on. OK, so how does this work? So we first train individual networks for object detection on pre-existing data sets. For example, for color images, we train a model to do 2D object detection on um, cityscapes or kitty. For depth, we use. Um, Kitty and for thermal images, we use the FLIR data set. So we train these individual networks uh, on these separate data sets. And then we use these um, student teacher training framework. So um, surprisingly, when we first tackled this problem, we thought there would be an approach to do multi teacher to single student training. But um, this didn't happen to be so, and we were really surprised by this, but because we thought there would be many cases where you want to have multiple teachers and distill knowledge from multiple teachers to one student. And um, there was many approaches that do the opposite, having one teacher to multiple student. Um, but in this work, uh, we proposed the first multi-teacher to single student distillation approach here. So we propose our loss function here that we call as MTA loss that um, basically aligns the intermediate layers um, of these multiple teachers with the student. So once these teachers are trained, the networks here, the, the weights of these networks are fixed. Then we use our own data set that we collected without any labels um, to then align the features of these um, three teachers with the one student here. And then we use also um, a loss function. Here we use the standard focal loss to also align the outputs of the student with that of the teacher while training. So this is completely unsupervised. We only train them on existing data individually. And then um, here the student has uh, spectrograms of the sound as input. And then it predicts bounding box coordinates um, in the image frame here. And then while deploying, you throw away the teachers and you can use only the student um, to then predict the coordinates in any of these, um, uh, on any of the coordinate frames of these um, visual modalities. Um, so this is just an extreme case to show you if we can do this with sound, but you can also replace sound with any other modality, and this is completely generic, um, generic distillation approach. So some quantitative comparisons. So uh, on the bottom here, you see our approach, which we call as MM distal net or multimodal distal net. And we see some um, baseline comparisons. So, so the stereo sound net uses only one modality. This is an existing approach from 2020. And here, uh, combinations of two modalities. So this is either RGB and sound or depth and sound or thermal and sound, which is you know from one modality to another. And um, this baseline is also just having an average of each modality and not just doing distillation. And as we can see here, we achieved substantial about 10 um, percentage points, 10% improvement in the average precision for detection 
uh, this this truly shows you the power of distilling knowledge from multiple modalities to um, another modality. And we also use this for tracking later on. So what does this sound like? So um, here are some results. I hope you can hear the sound here. So the inputs is only the spectrograms from these sounds. And you can see even when we have quite a bit of noise with the tram moving around, you can still, um, the network is still able to capture these detections in real world noisy scenarios. And if you use some other modalities, if you just replace it, this with um, something else like LIDAR, for example, this works even better because sound is in general really noisy. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this talk. Um, I think we have some time and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. And all of the work that we presented today, the data sets, the code is entirely open source and you can find this in our labs website here. Thank you and I have, I'm happy to answer questions that you have. Thank you very much, Evanov. That was a great talk. Um, yeah, does anyone now have a question? Um, put your hand up, uh, unmute yourself. Um, uh, while we're waiting. Um, so with the, uh, that, uh, that last one uh, you were talking about with the sound, um, so uh, the goal was to reduce the number of labels. Um, so does that now allow you to uh, kind of do something that wasn't possible before um, in terms of, kind of autonomous driving uh, at this point, or is it still kind of at the point where more work or kind of more performance is required to reach that uh, kind of threshold? That work basically gives you an ability or the, uh, a framework to distill knowledge from a labeled modality to an unlabeled modality. So imagine now you have some large pre-existing data sets. We have these huge data sets for images mostly. Um, and then you have another modality which you don't have labels for. Let's take um, LiDAR or I don't know, thermal camera or anything else. You can still train um, a network to do perception tasks by leveraging um, labels from one modality to train another modality that doesn't have labels. So I think this gives you a really powerful framework to not always require um, labels for each modality that you have, that you may have on your car. And another factor here is that um, if we do this only from one modality to an unlabeled modality, um, this uh, it works much better if you distill knowledge from diverse modalities, which which are um, you know which capture different properties of the um, environment. So different lighting conditions, different um, weather, and so on. For example, thermal works better than color images in the night. So if we use both color and thermal images together to distill to lidar, for example, this works better than just doing color to lidar. So um, things like that. So it gives us both of these capabilities, which I think is quite powerful um, frameworks to use. Okay, yeah, great. Um, does anyone else have a question? I have a question. Um, so uh, yes, again, it's about the, you know, the uh, questions that uh, Philip asked the same, but I'm curious, you know, like, is there a particular reason to employ like eight microphones on the car? Like, the, say, stereo, say, if you have only two mics, you know, does it work the same? Like, the, in terms of performance? Is there a particular reason? Great question. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I think we did experiments. I'm not sure exactly eight. So, initially, we just collected data with eight because we were collecting a lot of data. We didn't want to. Um, collect the data and then realize that it doesn't work anymore. So we just used eight because we thought um, it gives us more high fidelity for uh, distinguishing objects around the car. But if I remember right in the paper, we have ablation, which shows that four is enough. After that, the performance increase kind of plateaus, basically. It doesn't give you much more after you add four. 
but I'm not exactly sure if that number is four or that's more, but I'm pretty sure it's somewhere around four and five and eight, it doesn't increase anymore. And I think it's just, just because around the car when you have, um, when you have two and that's like really noisy, um, you, you can still, you know, because two are just right next to each other. I think if you don't do any, I mean, you can do these noise suppression techniques and so on. If you just um, record the noise for one second and subtract that from, you know, uh, the background noise that, that improves and things like that. But if you don't do any of these additional signal processing, then we found that having these four to five mics works better than just having two. Okay, and in, the, in this case, I think eight is really an overkill. <laughs> but yeah, right. that's good, yeah. Yeah. So I, th I think, um, yeah, as I said, like it was just when we when we were collecting the data, we just wanted to, I mean, it's like five five bucks, right? So it's not a lot to just, and and it's also not a lot of lot of memory or something to store these um, mono single mic recordings. So we just thought, you know, even maybe for future work or something, it might be useful. So we just wanted to collect it um, either way. Yeah, thanks for that. Does anyone else have a question? Um, another question. Um, did have these uh, uh, any of these uh, kind of findings uh, gone into your uh, robotic boat uh, startup company? Um, no, not no. actually. Actually, I left the startup before I joined my PhD. Okay. So uh, since then, I haven't actually been um, working on the company anymore. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. uh, if no one else has a question, um, I think um, that, that wraps it up. Uh, thank you again. I have another that was a really great talk. Thank you very much.